We want to grow as Christians and grow in our love and desire to, so, uh, to follow our God. Why do we have this joy? Well, it's been common to the people of God throughout the ages. Psalm 100 says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good. And his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Wonderful news there. And we're going to sing that psalm. We're going to sing all people that on earth do dwell.
that we would be able to hand that joy on to subsequent generations until you return. Lord, show us yourself and we will be joyful. Amen. 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 Um, we are going to have a, a Bible reading now. Uh, are you ready? It's very early in the service. <laughs> Hooray! We're going to, our Bible reading is going to come from... And Mabel's going to give us our Bible reading. And our Bible reading is coming from Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, verse 11. Luke 19, verse 11, down to 27. And if you have one of the few Bibles in front of you like this, you'll find that on page 1053. Page 1053. Uh, Heavenly Father, as we turn in our Bibles to your word, turn our hearts towards you and give us ears willing to hear. In Jesus' name, Amen. Parable of the ten minas. Jesus While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable. Because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called ten of his servants, gave them ten minas, put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for a servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, sir, your mina has earned 10 more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in every small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid you, because you were a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I'm a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. Sir, they say, he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what he will be taken and even what he has will be taken away. But those enemies but, but those enemies of mine who did not want me to be a king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Amen. Amen. This is God's word to us this morning, and we're going to sing now. Um, we have two singers that are desperate to sing this song, so we're going to sing the first verse with them, and then we are going to uh, sing together. I have decided to follow Jesus. Now, who's this? And why are you wearing that hat? <laughs> Look at that! Isn't that good? Butlings. Where did you go? To Butlings. Yeah, to Butlings. And Children would play with these, and you have to hit it, yeah. and you have to trace it. Cool. Does it run away from you, or does it yes, come out? Yes, like this. Oh, 
us good. Yay! Yay! <laughs> it's like a yo-yo. It's a, a yo-yo, an easy yo-yo for you. Yeah, wonderful. That's great. Well, that's lovely. Thank you for showing that. So will you sing with me the first verse of I have decided to follow Jesus and then we'll all stand together and uh, we'll do it. So, <coughs> okay. Civilization, 
and build amazing, amazing buildings as well, can't you? That's right. And then you have to survive. There's survival mode, and there's these horrible things that come towards you, and you have to fight them off, and you have to defend the place that, where you're living. Is that right? Yes. So that's called Minecraft. Well, Jesus has just given us a parable called, uh, that I'm going to call Minuscraft. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, it's a bit of a terrible part, but that's the best I could come up with. Minuscraft. <laughs> What's a minus? What do you think? That's true, that's one way of thinking about it, but Jesus uh, told this story. And he said that there was once a, uh, a Greek king and he uh, was going to a far country, and so he called his servants together and he gave each of them ten minus each. And minus is an enormous sum of money. But now this is a very, very similar story to the parable of the talents. Uh, but the reason that Jesus told the same story twice is because we ignore the first one, so we need to hear it again in a different way. Because we need to take this seriously. It was just so important that he had to tell it as many ways as he could so that we get, get this into our hearts and our minds. So, he, so he, in this version, he says, same idea, I'm going away, I'm going to give you an important sum of money. It wasn't as, uh, the talent was an absolutely extraordinary, it's billions of pounds worth. Uh, the, uh, uh, a minus was about three months' wages, a bit, not, bit more than that. But if you had ten of them, that was over a year's wages. That was great! I'd like a, a whole year's wages given to me in, in one go. That would be fantastic, and I'm sure most of us would like that. But he went away, and then he came back. And he said, what have you done with, uh, with the investment that I gave you? Now, some people, when they play Minecraft, they just go around blowing up stuff and attacking things, and they never do anything constructive, do they? And other people, they uh, go into survival mode, and they try and gather resources, and then they have to protect those resources, and then they try and build a house, and then they build a bigger house, and then they start gathering sheep and taming them, and all sorts of other things, don't they? So some people are lazy, and some people do something productive, don't they? Which do you think Jesus wants us to do until he returns? Be productive, that's right. It's kind of fun blowing stuff up in Minecraft. But Jesus wants us to be minus crafters. He wants us to take the good things, the gifts that we have, the resources that we have, and use them not to become rich and wealthy, not to build, uh, uh, to, to build uh, um, enormous buildings and gather sheep and everything else. He wants us to use those gifts that we have to advance his kingdom. So I'm going to be talking to the adults a little bit later about that because Jesus is coming back and he's going to ask each and every one of us, what have you done with the gifts that I've given to you? Have you used them to advance my kingdom? Is Jesus going to say to you, well done, good and faithful servant? Or is he going to be very, very sad that you just went around blowing up stuff and killing things? <laughs> okay. Uh, we are going to take up a collection now. Uh, oh, before we do that, we're going to have the notices. Uh, Martin. Well, Martin's coming up. I just thought, um, the, we're still members of the Sussex Gospel Partnership, and um, they have a uh, Women's Day um, uh, with speaker Charlotte Corns, and she is going to be speaking about Esther. That's on Saturday, the 10th of June. Uh, if you're interested in that, you can take one of these leaflets afterwards and uh, find out more about that. I might um, announce that again next week as well. Martin. Well, you all, they have a prayer team this morning. Uh, as always, today that is Roger and Jenny. And they give us away, so Roger and Jenny will be around to pray with you at the end of the service down at the front. Uh, it's home groups this week and Zoom prayer on Thursday. As always, please join us if you can. And Joyce has put out for us the next... Uh, uh, newsletter from Operation Romania Trust. So there's a few copies out on the table when you go and get a cuppa. Uh, they're also put up on the wall on the ORT notice board. If you want a copy to take home and uh, they've already run out, uh, just go and see Joyce. I'm sure Joyce will get you another copy. And now we have Chris and Chris. <laughs> Well, I come up 
again this week and give you my uh, latest update on how things are going with the uh, church cottage. Uh, they're going pretty well and uh, it's uh, all down to the faithful servants who come along and helped us so much over the last couple of weeks. And I have to say this week I, I've got about 13 or 14 people sessions booked for help and work on the cottage so it's coming along nicely. Uh, we're getting to the stage now where we've got to wash the walls down and then sandpaper all the paintwork and uh, start getting it looking really spick and span. It's not too late to uh, give a gift uh, under our sort of 50th anniversary uh, celebrations and uh, you'll find envelopes like this one on the table back in the hall when you go out for your tea and coffee at the end if you can give Give whatever you can, even if it's just a simple, small amount. The Lord will bless it, as he does those who offer their minors to him. So, yeah, thank you. God bless. Thank you. On the 11th of March, oh, I'm a bit near the microphone. On the 11th of March is the skill swap shop, which uh, Chris had got down as flower power. It was my idea that we plant a terrarium, a little... Uh, greenhouse thing that you can put in your front room and grow plants in. Um, unfortunately, the cost of those are £8.99. Uh, there is a list in the hall on, on, on the table as you go for your tea and coffee. If you want to plant one, if you could just put your name on please and then it gives me a chance to purchase uh, the ones that are required before the 11th of March. Um, I'll supply the plants, compost, and uh, a few little pebbles to put in there. So if you could just adhere your name to the list, please, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take up a collection now. If you're a guest, you're allowed to, uh, to allow that to pass you by. But we give with joy to our glorious God to advance his kingdom. <coughs> We just bow our heads. Heavenly Father, you are good and generous to us. We thank you and praise you that you provide for us. And we thank you, dear Lord, that you are so generous. We have more that we can give to you. We thank you, dear Lord, for all of your provision. We take these gifts that we offer to you, not just our monetary gifts, but also our time, our talent, our love, our support, our fellowship, our prayer life, everything that we have, dear Lord. Take it all and advance your kingdom through it. Lord, we want to lift up to you those that are going through a difficult time at the moment. We pray for Amjad and Shamshad as they struggle with the uh, Shamshad's uh, 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 difficulties. We just pray, dear Lord, for her healing, for strength, for blessing. Yes, yes. For both of them, dear Lord, please yes, show them your mercy. Mm -hmm. We pray for Marlene's father, um, Eric uh, Birchoy. Lord, please have mercy on him uh, with, his, uh, with his cancer. Lord, please, he's so ill. And he needs your healing. He needs your grace and your peace. Show yourself to him, dear Lord. Have mercy on him. We pray for Sylvia, uh, Sylvia Nichols, and uh, after her fall, we pray that you keep her safe, dear Lord. Show mercy to her. Bless her and help her. 
We pray for our other elderly as well, Lord. Keep them safe in their homes. We thank you for the nursing homes and for everything else. Please, dear Lord, continue to build them up. Give them your peace. We pray again for, uh, for peace in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Again, we think of a, a whole year of war over there. We're appalled and disgusted at it, and we just pray that you would uh, stir up the politicians to meet around the negotiation table and to find a way of peace. Stop the fighting, dear Lord. Mm -hmm. Lord, finally, we continue to pray for the recovery of the people in Syria <coughs> and in, um, uh, in Turkey as well after that terrible earthquake. Lord, please help them to rebuild their lives. Help them to find the resources that they need. Thank you for the generosity of this church and for other churches that have uh, sent things over to Syria. Lord, uh, please take and use all of these things to help people rebuild their lives. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, children, for being so patient. And you're welcome to go out to your Sunday schools now. And again, thank you for all the Sunday school teachers and the hard work that they've uh, done into preparing. And we are now going to uh, commit ourselves again and worship God in song. All I once held dear, built my life upon, is nothing, nothing compared to knowing Jesus. <laughs>
find that on page 1053 of the Pew Bibles, 1053, Luke chapter 19, verse 11. And we're looking at the parable of the ten minas. <clears throat> Let me just briefly give this to you as I understand it, uh, how this was relevant to the disciples. Never forget that when Jesus is speaking, yes, he speaks directly to our hearts. Yes, we are challenged by his words. <clears throat> but when Jesus was originally speaking... He was always speaking to the disciples. He was preparing the disciples themselves for the trials and tribulations that they would face after he had gone to heaven. Uh, we also have uh, one, another important event that is alluded to countless times by Jesus, uh, but isn't actually recorded at the end of Acts, which is the destruction of Jerusalem as well. And that's an, imp an incredibly important event in terms of understanding the unity of the Bible. So uh, as Jesus was, uh, was preparing his disciples, he was reminding them that the, the kingdom of God wouldn't happen all at once. It wouldn't be a cheap and easy way of sorting everything out. There would be a delay. And so he gave them this, uh, this, um, this uh, parable that there was a king that was going to be appointed he was going to be away for some time and then he would return. So he gives the ten minas. As I said, there's a, uh, this is an important thing. Uh, he had to say, to say this because the disciples just couldn't quite believe the things that Jesus was saying. He used on another time an example of, of talents. This time it's ten minas. Because maybe with the talents they're thinking, well, it's not fair because one guy got five talents, and another guy got three talents, and another guy got only one talent. And so, well, I'm just a one talent guy, and it's not as fair. Uh, so Jesus said, look, you're missing the point. Here's the same thing again. This time it's just ten minas. It's less, but it's still an enormous sum of money. But each of them got ten minas. So let's level the playing field. Nobody's got any excuses now. Everybody's got the same. Jesus says, it's going to return. As I understand the way that the Bible uses language when, uh, when we have this, uh, this uh, image of God coming in judgment in the Old Testament, he sometimes comes in clouds of judgment. Jesus returned, as I understand it, in clouds of judgment in AD 70 to destroy Jerusalem. And so, Jesus, uh, that's, uh, that's a foretaste of his final coming, uh, in the last days, but the, uh, 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 in the context of preparing the disciples, he's trying to prepare them for this in incredibly traumatic event. And he doesn't want them to be complacent. He knows that they're, they're, they're not all going to be in equally important, but he knows that each of them needs to be challenged. So he gives this parable, and he says, the first one came, he says, your minister has earned ten more. Well done, good and faithful servant. You, be, you have been trustworthy in a very small matter. Take charge of ten cities. He said, uh, the second one came and said, Sir, your minister has earned five more. He said, uh, take, uh, has earned five more. Take charge of five cities. And so the disciples were incredibly influential in the early church. In fact, some of them were so influential that they wrote gospels. They wrote down accounts of Jesus. Uh, some wrote letters. And they have continued to have influence. Just like a, a mayor may have an enormous influence over a city. Those that were faithful to Jesus actually wrote down these things. Uh, others planted churches. Others went as missionaries. And they fa founded colonies of the kingdom of God. But some of them... Jesus knew that they needed to be stirred up, to be challenged. And so he said to them, another servant came and said, Look, here's your minister. I kept it hidden. I was afraid of you. You're a hard man. I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. How did you know? Why didn't you put your money on, on, on deposit so when it came back, at least have interest? And then it says uh, he, um, that he took, take the minutes away from him and give it to the one who has ten minutes. That doesn't seem fair, does it? And yet, if you understand it in its original context, uh, the, the, there, there were people like Judas, there was people like uh, Hymenaeus and Demas that Paul was betrayed by and let down by. 
It was people that didn't do what they were supposed to do that are recorded in the New Testament. And yet, here we are, with a whole Bible, being influenced by these early people. But as a result of that unfaithfulness and as a result of the unfaithfulness of the Old Testament people of God, the city was destroyed. Which explains verse 26 and 27. I tell you that everyone who has not has been given more. Uh, but these enemies of mine who do not want me to, bring, uh, to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Remember again what the, uh, what the crowds in Jerusalem chanted when uh, uh, Jesus was going to be crucified. Uh, is this man guilty, Pontius Pilate? Do, what shall I do with him? Crucify him, crucify him. But he's your king. We have no king but Caesar, they said. Take this man away from us. And judgment came on them. Those are real historical events. And because those are real uh, historical events, we can trust that when Jesus is prophesying about his return in glory and the final judgment, that too is just as real a historical event in our future. But as far as Jesus is concerned, in the certainty of the mind of God, Jesus is returning and there is a final judgment. Yes, we are all covered by the blood of Christ. Yes, we are forgiven. But the Bible still says that every one of us must give an account of our lives before God. That's the reality that Jesus needs to, uh, to challenge us with today. And so yes, this has an original application, but it has an ongoing application for us in every generation. Each and every one of us have to stir up our, our hearts, examine ourselves, and think to ourselves, Lord, Lord, please change me. Don't let me become complacent. Don't, don't let me take grace for granted. Don't let me just become sloppy because I know that you're loving and forgiving. In Jesus' time, people distorted who God was by imagining that God, uh, God was, uh, was a harsh taskmaster. Jesus <coughs> says, uh, um, uh, another servant says, I was afraid of you because you're a hard man. You take what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. There's times in the history of England where we've had a very harsh, legalistic type of Christianity where God has seemed very distant and judgmental and, uh, and di uh, uh, people have just been unable to relate to them. And then today we go to the other extreme. The other extreme, of course, is that God's wonderful. He's so nice. He's so kind. He's so gentle. He wouldn't say boo to a fly. He's just uh, uh, incapable of doing anything because he's too soft and gentle. And there's not that much he can do about evil because that might hurt somebody and that might be unloving. So God's a bit, a bit passive in all of this. But the good news is that it doesn't matter how you live your life or what you do because God will just forgive it and forget it anyway. And don't worry about things like judgment. See, there's always been these barriers that uh, give people excuses for not faithfully serving God. People always invent gods for themselves. We always have two choices. Either we're going to accept God as he has revealed himself in the Bible to us. Either we hear the voice of God speaking to us from above with full authority through the words of the Bible, or we stand in judgment over the Bible. And we say, no, this is not true. I like this bit, but I don't like this bit. Because I know better than God. I have such wisdom and such discernment that I can discern that God is really like this, and he's not at all like this, despite what the Bible says. And that's always been the dilemma of the church. That harsh, distant uh, uh, judge that was so cold and indifferent that some Christians invented in our shameful past has been replaced by a soft, sentimental God that's equally much an idol, an invention of the human mind. And in both cases, it was people saying that they knew better than what the Word of God itself said. That's always the excuse. Jesus is trying to challenge us. 
Another excuse that we often come up with ourselves is that we want the easy way out. That was a problem for the disciples themselves. Back in verse 11 it says, while they were listening to this, they went on to tell a parable. Because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. I must admit, that's a very, very tempting thing, isn't it? Wouldn't it be wonderful if Jesus came back this afternoon? Wouldn't it be wonderful if none of us had to go through death, if we just were all caught up in the air and we were with Jesus forever, and there was a new heavens and a new earth, and God wiped away every tear? That's definitely something we should all long for. But it's very easy to allow that to uh, become the total thing that we depend on God for, and then when Jesus doesn't return this afternoon, when he doesn't return before the hospital appointment, when he doesn't return before that interview, when he doesn't return before that thing that you're fearing, then you become disappointed, let down. God has failed you. He didn't return. He hasn't t given you the easy way out. So we need to hear this as well. Jesus knew that uh, we have to hold both truths. We have to live always in the longing and expectation of Jesus' return. In that knowledge that one day we will stand before him, but beyond that is the glory of the new heavens and new earth. Beyond that is the, his being with Jesus forever, having every tear wiped away, and no more pain or death or suffering, no more disappointment. But also the reality picking up our cross and following him. So Jesus says, don't be complacent. Don't look for the cheap and easy way out. Yes, there is good news. Yes, there are rewards to come. Yes, there's a glorious future for you. Yes, there is enormous blessings to look forward to, and they're even greater if you anticipate them. But between now and then, it's hard work. And so he uses... This example from, I guess, as we put it today, from the world of business. From the world of taking things and using them, developing them. Minecraft is a, a wonderful uh, game for children. It can get a little bit obsessional for them. <laughs> I see a shivering parent down the front who has watched many, 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 many hours uh, sat in front of the computer, just like our children as well. But the, on the good, on the good uh, side of it, uh, it's, uh, uh, when, it's, when it's played well, it's a good life lesson. Because it's all about gathering resources. It's all about hard work. It's all about trying to, uh, to dig down and develop things and mix things and create new things. And uh, uh, out of a, a world that is uh, untamed and wild, trying to build a civilization. Jesus, part of what Jesus is calling us to do. But it's not acquiring lots of wealth, but rather cultivating aspects of the kingdom of God in our lives, in our community, and in our church. And it's hard work. And it's very easy in the face of that hard work to find excuses for not being involved in that hard work. So he gives us motivations. He, he says, uh, um, the uh, king returned. He sent for the servants when he had given, he'd given them money in order to find out what they had gained from it. The first came and said, Sir, your minna has earned ten more. And here's the most glorious words. I hope and pray that every single one of you has a deep longing in your soul. So that you're not 100% fearing and terrified of that great day of judgment. But rather, in a way, you're looking forward to it. So that you can hear those precious words, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little, now you have charge over much. Now you can continue that blessing. You can magnify that blessing. You can extend that blessing throughout all eternity. Well done, good and faithful servant. Notice how uh, neither of these 
uh, um, first two servants are condemned or criticized in any way. They were both given the same amount. One was given ten and came back with ten. Another was given ten and only earned five more. But both are received with love, with joy. Thankfully, grace isn't performance-based, but grace does require a response from us. You don't have to earn your way into heaven, but you do need to respond to that grace. And it's, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take me, take my time, take my thoughts, take my talents, and help me to use your, the gifts that you have given me to advance your kingdom. And so we come with a willing heart. We come with a desire to be faithful, to, uh, to be a blessing. We come uh, say, accepting that each and every one of us, we might not feel like we've got much to offer, we <coughs> might not feel like we're incredibly gifted, but we come with a sincere desire to take what we do have and use it. And that will be in a public, visible way in the context of the church uh, for some people. And for many other people, it will be in a very hidden way. Jesus has no problem with the fact that uh, um, some, uh, many of the things that most please him aren't public ministries. They're often things that only one other person knows about. That phone call that you make, that love, that, uh, that card that you sent, that uh, shoulder to cry on, that encouragement that you gave. That love, that time. Sometimes it's the boring stuff and it's administration, the paperwork. Sometimes it's serving over in the cottage or sometimes it's any number of other things. But each and every one of us has been given good gifts by God. We can't judge one another on the basis of whether we've noticed or not. We don't live to try and impress one another either. What we, do, what we do is we live in good conscience before God. We seek to have that good conscience. Many, many of us have served God very faithfully for many, many years. And old age is catching up on us. We no longer have the energy, the health, to be able to serve God in the ways that we have in the past. All of that service that you gave for all of those years hasn't been forgotten about by God. They're still all part of that well done, good, faithful servant. And God knows your limitations. God understands that you don't have that energy, that you don't have, that, you, that the pain limits you, that the, uh, that the ability to move about, the, the uh, sphere of driving at night, and all of those other things that are now uh, a, a reality in your life. God knows, he understands, he cares. He takes all of that into account. But he still says, pray with me, spend time with me, read my word, in private, in secret, pray for other people. All of us can use those good gifts that God has given to us. Every single one of us can advance his kingdom and be a blessing. In ways that God will only ever recognize, and when he returns, when he will say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Or, or we can have a little pity party. Or we can say, well, I just couldn't do it, to be honest. And here's my excuse. That's what the last servant did. His excuse was to blame God. It's not my fault. It's your fault, God, because if you'd given me better health, if you if this terrible thing that happened, this, if this disappointment didn't happen, well, I would have been great. I would have felt I would have had all the energy and time. I would have been felt, felt a lot happier and I would have gone on with it. But it's your fault, God, because you didn't give me those things. That was the problem with the last servant. He misunderstood the nature of his, God, of his master. And so each and every one of us has to understand who God is. Yes, he is judged, but he is also kind. Yes, he is uh, going to hold us to account, but he's also merciful. He's provided Jesus. 
He has made a way for us to know and be secure in His love. But he also longs for us to fulfill the potential that He has placed in our hearts and in our lives. He wants us always to be a better version of ourselves. And what does a better version of yourself look like? It looks like Jesus. We follow Jesus. We have to know Jesus. We have to know who Jesus is and what his priorities were, where his courage came from, how he stood up to things, and how he was gentle and merciful and kind. We look to Jesus. And then we remember that there is a judgment. A much needed and a much deserved judgment as we look at the horrific <coughs> corruption and cruelty in this world. You wonder, how do these rich people get away with it? How is it that these politicians that do such evil and cause such bloodshed, how is it that God doesn't strike them down now? <coughs> they will have their time. <laughs> there will be a reckoning, there will be a time where they will have to give an account, a public account. And all the lies will be exposed and all of the spin will seem irrelevant and stupid and the shame will be theirs. And yes, justice, justice will be finally be done. If you are upset about some of the worst of the corruption that happens in this world. If you wonder why that these prominent, powerful, rich people manage to do such evil and are ne always managed to get away with it, if you feel any sense of frustration and injustice about that, how do, you feel, how do you imagine that God feels about it? There will be that day of judgment. And they will understand. There will be no excuse for but if that's going to be true for them, we need to remember that God is no respecter of persons. Each and every one of us, high and low, rich and poor, on this side of the world or on the other side of the world, each and every one of us must also give an account. But with the blood of Jesus, with the blood of Jesus, yes, we've all failed. Yes, every single one of us had fallen down that uh, short of that standard. Yes, every single one of us could be beating ourselves up at the moment and thinking, oh, I'm such a failure, I've let God down so much. What hope is there for me? What hope is there for you? Go to God again in prayer. Confess your sins to Him. And then receive His forgiveness through the blood of Jesus. Know that all of your failure and all of your shame is washed away. Know that it is left on the cross, buried in the tomb and left there forever. And you are free. Free to become more like Jesus. Free to access that divine power that comes from the Holy Spirit to do the good things that God calls us to do. Free to accept his grace. Free to accept the limitations that God has imposed on you through sickness or old age or health or pain or whatever else. Free not to beat yourself up because you can't do the things that you used to do, but free now to say, well, Lord, okay, things have changed. I still want to be faithful to you. Even within these limits, show me what I can do. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you. Lord, we thank you that in, uh, we could be uh, just filled with fear and dread and self-loathing, but rather because of grace. We are loved and forgiven. And so we're just all the more grateful, Lord, all the more amazed of your great, great love. So, Lord, place into our hearts that desire to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Help us to live our lives knowing that we'll, we will be judged, but also knowing that Jesus was judged in our place. Knowing that forgiveness is full and assured, and knowing that out of that forgiveness, 
we can live a better life to please you. Bless us, encourage us, motivate us for more service, for more love, for more obedience, to advance your kingdom. And we pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 I'm going to conclude our worship now as we sing, Who is on the Lord's side? Who, who will serve the King? Who will be his helpers? Other lives to bring? Who will leave the world's side? Who will face the foe? Who is on the Lord's side? Jesus. We need to be on his side.